The first U.S. presidential debate is over and done, and what a debate it was. Bluster and braggadocio, truth and falsehood, and a heavy dose of personal attacks. But now that the dust has settled, we know a little bit more about how Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton would steer the world's largest economy if, indeed, they became president. Hillary Clinton introduced her plan as an economy that works for everyone, not just the rich. What would that look like? Well, Clinton plans investment in infrastructure, clean energy, advanced manufacturing, and small business. She explicitly called for a higher minimum wage and called for family-friendly measures like affordable childcare and earned sick days. Clinton's policies are aimed squarely at the middle class voters she will need to win the presidency. Trump needs those voters too. And while he has a different strategy for wooing them, it's one we've heard before. The Donald stuck with the core economic theme that's earned him so many loyal fans. America's being cheated out of jobs by unfair trade deals. The solution, Trump said he'd renegotiate the trade deals and stop American firms from shipping jobs abroad, hinting at retributionary tariffs. The other key part of Trump's plan is lowering corporate taxes leading to job creation. Hillary Clinton didn't think too highly of that. The kind of plan that Donald has put forth would be trickle-down economics all over again. In fact, it would be the most extreme version, the biggest tax cuts for uh, the top percent of the people in this country than we've ever had. I call it trumped up trickle-down. Aha. Uh -huh. Of course, Trump had a few zingers of his own. And Hillary, I just ask you this. You've been doing this for 30 years. Why are you just thinking about these solutions right now? For 30 years you've been doing it, and now you're just starting to think of solutions. U.S. financial markets gained ground today following the debate. The Mexican peso, highly sensitive to potential risks from a Trump presidency, rose more than 2 percent, and the U.S. dollar lost value against other global currencies. Felix Salmon is a senior editor at Fusion. Felix, in watching those markets react, are, are they actually convinced that something fundamental changed last night, or were they just looking for a reason to breathe a sigh of relief. Well, having gone through the whole Brexit thing where the pound rallied because everyone was convinced that we were going to stay in the European Union, I'm not entirely convinced that the currency markets know what they're doing when it comes to political forecasting. But yeah, they're, they're, insofar as anyone knows what they're doing, it's probably the currency markets and they seem to think that Hillary got a boost from this debate. I, I just, in watching it last night though, and especially on that economic stuff where Trump has made such gains, I can't imagine one of his supporters saying, oh, you know what, maybe that guy is a little too unhinged to be president. I'm going to vote, or not going to vote, or I'm going to vote for Hillary Clinton. I just can't imagine any of them changing their mind as a result of last night. Can you? This is the most polarizing election that I can ever remember. And the idea that there are any undecided voters who are saying, well, I might vote one way, I might vote the other, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, who are these people? They're low information voters who are probably not watching the debate. But one thing we did see was a huge spike in people searching Google during the debate for how do I register to vote. I think what this probably might have done is help rally um, Clinton's base, especially among Hispanics, and making sure that younger Hispanics and younger Americans actually get out and vote, which they have generally not been very good at in previous elections. Hmm, fair point. Uh, in watching some of the U.S. financial networks today, a lot of them were talking about Hillary Clinton and, and where she is in this sort of evolution of her thinking on trade uh, and trade deals, in particular TPP. What do you make of that and, and the impact that that might have on sort of as we go forward in the course of this campaign? All of the major candidates, basically when it came down to Clinton and Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump, moved pretty far to the left on trade. They're all unanimous that it's a bad thing. They don't like TPP. They don't even like NAFTA in retrospect. And that's kind of scary because free trade has been incredibly good for America. And once Clinton is elected and is in office and gets to negotiate things, maybe she'll come around and, and declare victory on TPP and sign it after all. But I'm not holding my breath. I think we might have moved into a new era 
of much more isolationist trade policy. Well, I, and I, I mean, one of the overarching themes that at least I've seen coming out of this campaign is a consolidation of the fact that, you know, we used to always talk about, well, there's winners and losers in globalization and free trade deals. The, the people that have come out on the wrong end of that in the United States have become a, a force in politics during this campaign and are being really tapped into by uh, the Trump campaign. Is it something that both the Republicans and the, 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 the Democrats are going to have to address going forward in terms of we didn't do you guys very well when making these deals and we need to sort of make that right in terms of these communities that came out on the wrong end of globalization. Absolutely. And, and this, is, this is why Bernie Sanders did so well and this is why Clinton ultimately came out against TPP was to, move, was to tack left towards Sanders, towards that position. She at least has some kind of a policy to try and help the losers from globalization, um, which is more than you can say for Trump. But what no one is talking about is the winners, you know, because they don't vote, because they're in Vietnam or in Mexico. And so no one wants to mention the sort of global benefits to these trade deals. Fair enough. And, and I mean, you know, the, there are benefits that go through a lot of the society. You can buy a T-shirt cheaper. You can get a cheaper television. The 1% has done well. But it's that, that low income part that... That, that we just, I feel like we haven't had a lot of that conversation up until now. Uh, on the other hand, Clinton really hit Trump hard. Uh, I think her, in my opinion, her strongest moment was on his taxes and why he should release them. Is that the kind of thing, do you get the sense that that can really resonate, especially with two more debates to go? No. I, I feel like the, the Trump taxes issue has been litigated ad nauseum for months, and I doubt that she, bringing it up one or two more times in the debates is going to make any difference. I, I'm, as I say, I think the debates are good for trying to get out the vote. She has the ground game. She has the mm. people on the ground on November 8th who can make sure that everyone who is, has any likelihood of going to vote for her is going to get out there and vote for her. He doesn't have that kind of grassroots organization. So I, I, I'm hopeful that on November 8th, you know, she'll be able to, to pull a victory out. But he is a very scary man. And he's very good at this. I, I mean, he, he, is, he has become wildly underrated and he, he cons consistently batters through expectations. Um, it, it, are they still underestimating him? Yeah. I mean, and, and especially his recent rise in the polls. You know, polls are not everything and... You, you have to take them with a certain pinch of salt, but he has totally outperformed what everyone thought. Everyone thought when, when we had the Republican um, nomination race, everyone thought that if Trump won the nomination, then he would just flatline the minute that he needed to appeal to the entire country rather than just to the Republican faithful. And that hasn't happened. He has genuine, broad-based national support. Felix, we've checked in with you a couple of times now over the course of this campaign. From up here in Canada, I think a lot of us are watching it, and it still has that element of theater. What is it like down in the United States right now in covering this and, and in watching these events unfold and watching the polls stay close and, and, and as we get closer to Election Day? Well, as I say, as, as a Brit who, you know, I, it's, I have this feeling of deja vu, you know? It's this, like, you can't be serious. You cannot possibly be voting for this. Millions and millions of people across the country cannot possibly be voting for this. And then in Britain, it wasn't just millions of people. It was the majority who voted to basically cut themselves off from any kind of rosy future and sink into the North Sea somewhere. And the fact that a broad electorate can vote against its self-interest is very, you know, it's still a painful uh, wound personally for me. And I've seen it happen in the UK and I have no Faith, I mean, I, I think it won't happen in the U.S., but I, I'm, I fear that it could. Well, as we head into the home stretch, it's going to be fascinating to watch. Felix, thanks a lot for this. Thank you.